Amen. This morning, we are going to be digging into um, a few weeks on understanding love. How many of you are an expert in love? Okay, because if you are, come on up. You can help me with this. This would be great. But we're going to be learning to understand love and taking love from being a concept to actually becoming an application. How do we really apply love? Rather than just having it being a thought or a feeling, how is it applied? So love, the app for healthy relationships is what we're going to be looking at. So this morning, uh, if you have a bulletin with you, I hope you do inside, there's a little insert that talks about what we're going to be covering. But our scripture today is found um, in Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31. And this is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asking Jesus what, what's the greatest commands or what is the greatest commandment. And this is how Jesus responds. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. How many of you have heard that verse before? Okay. It's a pretty common verse. It's actually uh, tied into, in the, uh, in, in the Jewish faith, it is tied into uh, their core teaching, their, their Shema. It is something that they recite in the morning and in the evening. And they talk about this and how important it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And that sounds good, but how do you do it? To quote the um, 20th century theologian Tina Turner, um, <laughs> what's love got to do with it? <laughs> How do you do this? H how is this possible? What does it mean to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And I, I think it's something that I really want to take a, a few moments this morning and break apart because the problem with some of these verses that we hear and that we know, the problem with it is that we think since we can repeat it, we understand it. Right? We think since we can just pull it off from the top of our heads, oh, we know that. No, you know how to say that, but do you know what it means? Same thing like the Lord's Prayer. If I stop now and we pray the Lord's Prayer together, many of you could just repeat it word for word. If bagpipes came on and you heard Amazing Grace, you'd start singing. Right? These are things that we know, kind of. But do we know that we know? Is it deep inside? Do we, do we put it to life? Do we understand? It, it sounds good, and it is important. But do we understand how deep it can go? For example, I can understand what it means to love with all your heart, right? You look at Valentine's Day, right? And you see the, the, the cupids and the arrows and the hearts, and, and you can understand a heart love, right? But what does it mean to love with your strength? Think about that. How do you love with your strength? So I just want to share a little bit of my story. My story is kind of boring, but um, that's me. Um, when I was a teenager, I went to youth group so that I could sit beside Peggy Wilcox. <laughs> pure motives. Purely pure motives. Three hours a week, I could go and sit by Peggy Wilcox and my mom and dad was okay with that, and her mom and dad was okay with that, and I was more than okay with that. And so I, that's, that was um, why I went to youth group. And while I was at youth group, um, I started to actually listen after a while. I started listening to what the people were talking about and what was going on, and listened to a little bit when they talked about God and stuff. And they'd share some verses, kind of like these here. Oh, yeah, I heard those. Yeah, 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 I know what that means. Okay, no problem. But over the course of a while, I noticed Peggy Wilcox was not going to youth group anymore, and I was. 
And I'm going, what's up with this? Like, I even, like, what's, what's going on? And over the course of a few years, literally, I recognize with 2020 vision, because when you look back, you always have such good vision, but I never saw it at the time. But in 2020 vision, I saw that there was a, uh, a caring, a deliberate attempt by the leaders of that youth group and the pastor to show me what Christianity was, and show me what Christianity looked like applied in life. Not just, here's, you know, here's some words, memorize these and you'll be good. But what does it look like in, in the rough and in the, in the raw times? So I got to see what it looks like when a pastor and his wife has a dispute on how much money they spent on their groceries. I got to see what it was like when um, there was a hard time that was faced by another youth group couple and how they interacted with that. And I got to see what love looked like as it works through. I became a Christian at 18 years old. And when I was uh, becoming, a, when I was to the point where I was going to become a Christian, one of the things I had heard a lot spoken was, you know, you need to ask Christ into your heart. Any of you heard that phrase? You know, you need to ask Christ into your heart. And I am grateful that um, when, I be, when I was old enough to completely not just comprehend, but really desire to have God in my life, I re, I'm grateful that my pastor said to me, he said, you know, you need to ask Christ into your, I went, yeah, heart. No, your life. Okay. See, a lot of stuff that we have out talks about asking Jesus into your heart, and, and I see that, and I understand where they're going with it, and there's nothing terribly wrong with it. If there was, I'd have the whole entire Billy Graham Association coming down on me, <laughs> and uh, our webpage would be pulled off the web. But, um, but the truth is, is that it's, it's so much more important to realize that you're asking Christ into your whole life rather than just your heart. Here's what I want to talk about. I want you to consider your life as being a home where you live in. You live in your life as a home. How many of you have a favorite room in your home? Okay, so I'll just do a hands here. How many of you, your favorite room is your family room or your living room? How many for you is your favorite room, your kitchen? How many for you is your favorite room, that quiet room where you do some reading, maybe your bedroom or somewhere, that, that reading room and, yep. And for others, how many of you, your favorite room is your work room? You know, maybe it's your, it's your garage or your shed or your quilting room. How many is that, is that your favorite room? Okay. Here's, here's what I want to show you today. Um, Andrea's birthday today, so I thought I'd show a picture from when she was young. Um, <laughs> anyway, so um, this is the family room. In, in my construct, and what I want to try and, try and get across to you today, is imagine the family room as your heart of your life. Okay? If your life is a house, imagine the family room as your heart. That's the place where you go and, and you be with those that you love and you care about. Maybe it's the place where, you're, where you find your entertainment, the place where you uh, have your joys and stuff. I had to pick a, a picture from here because... Here's the silly thing. I tried to um, look up a picture of a, of a modern family room. And in the modern family room, this is what's sad. They had pictures of people all around there, but they were all on their screens. None of them were interacting with each other. So maybe a little bit of nostalgia to go back when people actually looked each other in the face. And, but in your heart, that's the place where you hold the people that you love, right? That's the place where you find your entertainment, you find your joy. And I kind of describe that kind of as the family room of your life. This is a place where God would like, to, like you to love him in your heart, in the place where you find the desires of your heart, in a place where God is welcomed in as family, where Jesus is someone that you sit and you chat with and you interact with and you enjoy being with. You got that? That's where God wants to be loved, there. But I like this place too, the kitchen. And for the kitchen, I view the kitchen as the soul of your life. 
okay? Because that's the place where you get fed. That's the place where there's beautiful aromas. That's the place where you have your preferred tastes. That's the place, kind of, if you look through Scripture, the place where most people ran into trouble with temptation was around food. <laughs> right from Adam and Eve and on through to, to Jacob and Esau, there's a lot of issues around that because there is something about being fed by God. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And so I view the kitchen as kind of the soul. Is there are certain types of foods that you enjoy and certain types of foods you don't enjoy? Um, for me, I, I like certain types of fish, but I hate smelling fish being cooked. I just hate it. And when I walk in the house and I smell fish, I'm like, ugh. Anybody have a flavor that when they smell, they just kind of pull back, right? Well, I view that kind of like as worship with the soul, right? Some of us really love certain flavors, but it's still good food, whether it's a flavor you like or not. Some people, oh, I love country. Oh, I love uh, traditional. I love the modern. I love the ancient. You know, we all have these different tastes and these different desires that kind of feed our soul. But it's still food, right? So I want you to think God wants you to love him in your soul, in that place where he can feed you, in that place where he can nourish you, in that place where you are given the energy and the power to get through the rest of the day of your life. You can enjoy your living room, but eventually you need to eat, right? And God wants to feed you from the soul of your life. And he wants you to love him with your soul. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. In the in the library of your home, in that quiet place in that home, in that place where you go to read and, and where you think through things deeply. That is uh, the mind. God wants you to love him with your mind. I'll share with you, um, and I, I share with you only just so you can connect dots, not because I am anything that special, that's for sure. When I was, uh, when I was a teenager, and I would struggle with, rejection. I would struggle with um, perception of being bullied and actual being bullied at times. When I, when I found myself vulnerable, I escaped to my mind. That's where I went. That was my safe house. I could go because I knew I was good at academics, and I knew I could understand logic, and I knew I could work through things mentally. And so I'd escape to the mind of my life. I'd go back there, and I could build my nice safe wall around me, and I could just live in my mind. You know, I didn't have to interact with people. I didn't have to worry about my heart getting hurt. I didn't have to worry about anything else. I could just go there, and I could just live there. And for some of us, there's different places where we love spending more time. And for me, it was difficult to get out of my mind and get into the other parts of my life. Jesus showed me how I could get out of my mind and, and to experience him from, from the soul and from the heart and from the strength. But the mind, that place where you think, that place of thoughts, that place of, of depth where you go intellectually, God wants you to love him there. Right? He wants you to love him there with that aspect of your life. So many people say, well, I love God in worship, but... You know, there's lots of things that I, I, I don't really believe up here about what he says. Well, he wants you to love him in your mind as well. And then the last place, doesn't that look like a nice little workshop? Isn't that, isn't that great? Um, trustees, if we could put one of those in the parsonage, that would be awesome. Anyway, um, a workshop, a quilting room, a sewing room. For some people... This actually is also their kitchen, because some people use their kitchen like uh, um, a production area. This is the place where they go and, and they make stuff. I view these places in your, in your house as being that aspect of your life where you're putting to work, enjoyably putting to work the things that you like to do. Uh, my father carves uh, ducks, 
And so he has his own, little, his own little area where he goes down and he takes a block of wood and he transforms it into a wood duck or a mallard or a, a, a gray jay or whatever the case is. And he's in his own world. He's doing something. He's doing it with his hands. He's doing it with his heart. He's enjoying it. And he's taking this little project and he's giving it to someone that he loves or he's, he's sharing it with someone else. He's using the gifts, talents, and abilities that he has and working away at something and he really enjoys it. This is the place where you love the Lord with all your strength. Right? This is where you do something. And so whether it's your kitchen or whether it's your sewing room, whatever, whatever makes sense in your head for the analogy, this is the place where you take the gifts, the abilities, the desire, the drive, and you create something with it, and you do something with it. And whether or not that's writing an encouraging card to somebody else, whether or not that is making a meal, whether or not that is a place where you work away and you provide something for someone else, that's the area of your life. God wants you to love him there, in that part of the life, in your vocational part of life, in your working part of life. And I say that and I use the illustration of, of a house because I've learned something really quickly. When people are done working, when they're retired, they're busier than when they worked. Can I hear an amen? amen. <laughs> okay. So this is a place that's always part of your life. Right? It's not like, oh, okay, well, I don't do that anymore. This is a place that's always part of your life where you're always doing something. So I want you to think about that. God wants you to love him in that living room, in the heart. He wants you to love him in the kitchen, in the soul. He wants you to love him in that, in that library, in that mind place. But he also wants you to love him with your strength in that workshop, in that, in that work area. And here's the thing. He wants you to love him in all those areas all at the same time. Think about that. He wants you to love him in all of those places at the same time. Because some of us will easily lean to, okay, God, I can love you with my heart, but I don't like loving you with what I do. There's other people, sometimes I fall into this category. I am so busy doing for God and I am enjoying God in the doing that I am neglecting the God that's filling the soul in the kitchen. And I'm neglecting the God in the study. Right? And sometimes I'm just about worship and I'm just in the kitchen. But God has stuff for me to do in the workshop. And he wants my friendship in the library. And, and sorry, in the family room. Get the idea there? Am I? Okay, good. So... I want you to see something else. Um, since I came to faith, and I'm just sharing my journey, since I came to faith from the place of, of my safe house was the mind, since I came to faith from the thinking it through, then in my mind, as I understood what God was saying and as I understood Jesus as truth and I understood how all of these things work, and as Stuart shows in the group that comes tonight to the apologetics to understand how, how God works through the science and, and the systems of life, for me, that's where everything had to start. It had to start there. But I'm using this symbol here of, of interconnected wheels. Is that That's where God started with me. But God could just have easily have started with me in the area of the heart. Or he could have started with me in the soul. I could have experienced him through worship. Or he could have, I could have experienced God by going and helping a neighbor just doing service and realizing, oh, I feel really good about this. I guess I'm doing what God wants me to do. Whatever the case is, all of those things are interconnected. In, in my logic mind, one of the things I struggle with is lists. How many are list makers? Okay. That's what I struggle with. I struggle with lists. I'll write out a list and then I'll rewrite it a second time. Anybody ever write a list and write it the second time? Because you write out everything you can think of first and then you go and you go, okay, priorities. Right? Now let's rewrite that list in priorities. Here's the priorities. And I have to be careful because in my Christian life, I automatically go, oh, I got the priorities all figured out. God wants to start in my mind. 
And he's going to take that truth, and that truth is going to take root in my heart. And so he goes from the mind to the heart, and then he goes to my soul, because uh, as that changes my heart, then it draws me into worship, and then I'll worship, and then there's the soul. And then from that, I'll have the strength to go and do things. So that's how God works. He works with the mind, the heart, the soul, the strength. Oh, good. Great. The problem is, is that I'm making the mind the master and the only channel where I'm looking for God to be communicating with me from. God can start in any area. Just ask this question. Have any of you ever felt joy? Okay? You felt joy. Do you know what happens when you feel joy? Joy can change your mind. Can't it? Joy, something you feel inside, can change your thinking. Joy can change your attitudes and what you're doing. Joy can change you around so that you now have a greater amount of love for others. Your heart is made bigger, right? God speaks through one area, turns it, and all the other dials turn, right? So God can work through your feelings. God can work through your working. God can work through your mind. God can work through your heart. He can work through all of these different areas. Don't limit him as to, oh, this is the only way he's going to do it. Right? He can work through all of it. The key is to recognize that they're all interconnected. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and see how connected this is. Okay, so here we go. This morning, this is going to be a practical message series, so we're going to put this into practice. So let's take a verse of Scripture. And I like starting with Scripture because I work from the mind. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> from 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter that is read at weddings. It is the most beautifully read, most least understood passages of Scripture that have ever been written. Love is patient. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Have you ever had to be patient? Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Love keeps no record of wrongs. Isn't that easy? This doesn't sound nice, but is it easy? No. The love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. Take time on your own and read through it and just see how much help you need from God in order to love the way he calls us to live. If it's not just a platitude up there, like, oh, isn't that nice? That'll fit well on a pillow. But if it's actually like, okay, so my life is to exhibit this. Oh, Lord, I need you because I am not patient because I do keep a list of who's offended me. All right? So I'm just picking out a section in here from <laughs> verse 7. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Okay? So that's the passage we have from Scripture. And so what I want to do is I want to just focus on one part of that scripture. Let's focus on the love bears all things. Okay? So for those of you that are ministered to through the mind, here we go. The word for bears is actually stego um, from Greek. And it, the word comes from the concept of roofing and like a thatch roof, putting a roof over something. So some versions have, if you have 1 Corinthians uh, 13 verse 7, and you have a different translation than I have, some of it might say, love covers all things, or love protects all things. You can see how they would use the word covers, protects, and bears, if it all comes from the root of the word meaning roof, or to cover, or to, to, to protect, to um, place over top of. Just as important it is, as it is to have a roof, um, this is what this passage of scripture is talking about. So when we see this, um, why do people have roofs on their houses? Right? right? Because we live in Canada and we'd freeze. To, no, because we want to be protected from the elements, of course. And there is a huge um, aspect of this verse telling us that true love wants to protect, wants to care for. L love wants to keep harmful things and threats away from. Um, to keep out. Uh, one who, uh, to not allow there to be uh, affliction or detriment or insult or offense uh, or indignity to come upon 
someone that you care for. Jesus actually shares this heart with us in a phrase that we would have heard a couple weeks ago in the scriptures. In Luke 13 and verse 34, as Jesus is after the, the big parade and his 15 minutes of fame, he looks at Jerusalem and he cries out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. The ones that we have, have as Father, Son, and Spirit have sent to you to communicate to you that we love you. And you stone them and you kill them. I still love you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. You see that? Do you see the heart of Jesus with that? I'm told that for folks that have uh, been around chickens and hens, that, um, that there is a unique sound that a hen makes when she believes that the chicks are in trouble. And the, the chicks will scatter from wherever they are immediately back to the mom to find that protection. This is what Jesus desires to do for those that have called upon his name, for, for Jerusalem, for the people of God. That's what he desires for them. Unfortunately, the last part of it says, and you were not willing. So that's what he wants to do, even though they won't do it. Even though they won't come to him, he wants to do that. That's the heart of God, right? Love bears all things, protects. And First Peter uh, the book of Peter, Peter was one of Jesus' uh, main apostles, the one upon which he would build his church. Peter wrote a couple of letters in Scripture, and one of them in 1 Peter, um, in verse four, in chap uh, chapter 4 and verse 8, he says this, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Right? There's a sense of when uh, you're loving and you're bearing all things and you're protecting all things and you're covering all things. It's, it's a sense of, there's a protection with it. I think of, and I shared last night briefly, that um, when the prodigal son uh, returned home, the prodigal son basically told his father, I wish you were dead, because if you were dead, I could get your money. But instead of that, just give me your money now, and I'll go off. And the father did it. And the boy went off, and he, he sowed every wild oat he had, and did everything else that he shouldn't have done that left him not only emptier, but abandoned and feeling useless and feel like he hit rock bottom. He did hit rock bottom. So many times we're told, oh, go do this and you'll experience life. Yeah, they'll experience life, the bottom of it. But when you hit rock bottom, then you build a foundation on that that can't be shaken, and that's what happened. He hit rock bottom and he returned home, and as he was returning home, he saw his father and his father ran. People don't run in these days. They might walk hurriedly if they were being chased, but they don't run. He ran to his son and grasped him and welcomed him back as being alive. You were dead, but now you are alive. He grasped hold of him and sees that he was just so grateful that he was there. He, I want you to think about this. Just Stop and put yourself in this situation. Somebody says to you, give me the money that I would have once you were dead, and I want to leave you. Right? Do you think there's a chance you might hold on to that a little bit? Do you think there's a chance when he comes back that you're going to go, oh, all's forgiven, all, don't, don't even worry about it. Is that where your heart is? I don't think that's where my heart is. But I know that's where God's heart is, because that's where we have the parable. Boy, God, I need that kind of a heart that can cover all sins, that can bear all things, so that I can be open to caring and love, even after there's been an offense. So that's one part of it. And then there's the other part where love perseveres. There is a sense of um, you would cover something to keep it uh, safe. Uh, like you can cover things with silence. That uh, Certain things are meant to be kept hidden and private. Uh, how many of you have a trusted friend that you know if you tell them something, it's not going to go anywhere? Right? Aren't they valuable? Aren't they the most wonderful thing? This is also what this verse is talking about. To be someone that will cover, that will protect, that will keep things safe and private that are supposed to be kept safe and private. Right? 
We, we see this, and, and this is described in the Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13. We see this, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. So great to have that safe place, that safe person that you can talk to and know that it is safe, and it's okay. It's not going to come back to bite you. Another uh, verse in Proverbs, whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Have you ever known someone that just can't let it go? That just can't let it go? Yes, we know she cut your Barbie's hair, but it's your 50th wedding anniversary and you need to invite your sister. Right? Now I use that as a light thing. I know there's some really heavy stuff out there that people deal with. I, I know that's just the nature of this fallen world. There's lots of really bad stuff out there. But if you can be able to uh, cover an offense and not repeat it, then you can see the relationship grow. This is the type of love that we're reading about. So when love bears all things, that's what we're looking about. Okay, so here we go. This is a practical sermon series, so here's how we're going to apply this now. I want you to take what we read at the very beginning of the service, that we are to love the Lord our God with all our, whole, all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. And to make this applicable, I'm going to encourage you to look at the following prayers. Now this is funny because I am not a liturgical person at all. I don't like written prayers. I'm actually laughed at because I'm one of the only ones that when we're asked to do a town thing or whatever, I don't bring a prayer up with me to read. I just pray as the Lord leads me to pray. So for me to write out a prayer for you is not something that I just go, oh great, always go to written prayers. You don't have to do this. But I wanted to give you a starting point. So let's start here. For to love the Lord with our heart, and we are to love from our heart, here's a heart prayer. Father God, I ask that you would change my heart, give me a heart, or enlarge my heart, so that I desire to, and am motivated by, a protecting, forbearing, persevering love, specifically in my relationship with blank. And the reason why I, I pr printed this out like this is so many times we think we're getting to the end of something and we're doing what God wants us to do and we stop just short. God, give me a heart that I can really be loving and forbearing like we see in Scripture. Amen. Sounds like a good prayer. Here's the problem. Where do I apply it? In what situation am I asking God to help me apply that in? Oh, well, apply it in the relationship with this person. Now, here's the other thing I want to say. Pick any person. It doesn't have to be the Hitler in your line, right? Like, oh, my land, God wants me to do this with that worst person ever. Start small. Start with a relationship that you really do care about. Start with someone that is really important to you, but that God can start and transform that love even greater. God, maybe it is a spouse, maybe it is a child, maybe it is a very dear friend, maybe it's a co-worker, whoever, but Lord, Lord, with this specific person, I ask that you would change, give, and enlarge my heart so that I desire to protect them, to, to forbear them, to, to preserve their uh, love specifically in this situation or in this place for this person. You got that? So start there. Now, here's, here's the trick. You don't end there. You go on and say, okay, God, if you're doing that in my heart, I also need you to do that in my soul. I saw this quote from C.S. Lewis. I thought it was awesome. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. Think about that one. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. Because the truth is, is that there is part of us that has a best before date and expires. And there's part of us that doesn't. And the part of us that doesn't is called the soul. Right? So you are a soul. That soul was placed 
in your mother's womb, in the beginning of that birth of that child. And then it will return back to God when uh, earth goes to earth, ashes go to ashes, and dust go to dust. So this core of who you are, this soul, this place where you um, are created uniquely by God to commune with God, that's what you have in you. And here is how you pray a suggestion for a soul prayer. Father God, I ask that you would so transform me that I know the presence of Christ and his love within me. Okay? I want to stop there because for a lot of us, we say, God, I want to know you, mind. God, I want you to transform me so I know your presence from my soul. Right? The word for soul is the same word as breath. It's the It's the life breath of God in you. Lord, I I want to experience life from you. Not just thinking, but I want to experience that life from you. And you're praying this specifically for yourself. How many of you have an easier time giving to someone else than receiving? Right? For you, I want you to do this prayer twice. (laughs) Because you have a hard time receiving anything. But when you do this, please remember what you heard about with those airline stewards and stewardesses on the planes. In case of emergency and the masks drop, place the mask on you first, then the children. Why? Because if you try and give the mask to the children and you pass out, you're all gone. But if you get your mask on first, then you have what you need to order to take care of the children. You get that? Same exact principles spiritually. God, if I don't have your love, if I don't experience your presence, if I don't feel that, if I don't know that, if I don't don't have it from you to give, I have nothing to give to someone else. So please let me know that and experience that first. And then as a loved child, fill me and free me to be your instrument of love as I seek to protect and cover and lift up whichever person or situation. It's the same one you talked about in the first one, right? You can't say, oh, I'll do this for this one, this for that. No, nope. same person, same situation, each one. Got it? That could be a hard one. Maybe you guys, I don't really know about sensing God's presence. That's kind of different. I like dealing with God more in my mind. Well, expand it, because he doesn't want you to just love him in your mind. All your soul, he says. Then the mind prayer. Father God, I ask that you would transform my thinking and my understanding. Right? That's the place where we process. Right? So Lord, transform my thinking, my understanding. Get rid of those negative voices in my head. Get rid of those things that are are teaching me wrong. I'm taking all these thoughts captive. And teach me and show me how, when, and in what ways I can demonstrate your love in practical ways in the following situations and relationships. And you list them off. And I have there a little pen and paper on the side because when you pray the mind prayer, have a pen and paper beside you. Expect God to give you answers. Expect him to bring things to mind. Now, some people say they have a hard time believing and understanding a still small voice in their head, how God can speak to them. So you say, God speaks to you. This was a whole thing in the States with Joy Behar ripping apart the American vice president because he's, he hears God. Oh, how can you hear God? Do you want to know about the still small voice? I want to ask you something. I want you to... Without opening your mouth, I want you to read that first line under the mind prayer. Okay? Did you do that? Did you hear something when you did that? Did you hear those words in your head as you were reading? Those weren't just letters. You heard those words as you were reading them. There is a still small voice going on in our head all the time. It's what we call our reading voice. It's what we call our inside voice. That's always going on. God can speak to you in that. There is always a voice going on inside of your head. It's whether or not you're reading it, or it's from a thought from the past, or it's something that's being brought in by God. Right? That's an amazing thing to think through. So, God, show me in my mind where practically, how, and what, applying this. How do I do this? In my, it, 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 what do I do? 
Show me in my thinking. Transform my thinking. And then the last one is the strength prayer. Father God, I am weak and you are strong. I was noticing this past week, and you guys probably have too, if you um, watch anything to do with astronomy, they're showing how the most amazing telescopes from the outer realms of our um, solar system are pointing out in all these deep, deep directions, and they still are not sure how far out the galaxies go. Right? How far out the galaxies go. And if you've seen photos of what they show of these, from these different um, constellations and whatever you see in the space, it's just absolutely mind-boggling to see what all exists out there. Each little flicker is a star, which, and maybe that's the largest star in its galaxy that we're seeing. And all of the planets and all the asteroids and all the comets and all of the different stuff that's going on out there, and we can't even begin to see it all. And yet sometimes we think we're pretty big stuff, don't we? We, 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 are, we are something else. I don't need anybody. I can do this. I'm, you're a vapor, is what it says in Scripture. You're like a grass for a season that comes and goes. Don't think of your strength in comparison to someone else's strength. Think of your strength as in comparison to God. Then you can pray this prayer. I am weak and you are strong. I recognize only you can give me the ability, strength, and capacity to bear, cover over, and protect whatever person, situation. So I ask humbly, God, that you would work miraculously through me so that they would experience your love. Jesus desires us to care for others in a way that shows that he is working in us. And, and through that, we are his witnesses. John 17 talks all about this. So here is your challenge. Um, and this is the beginning of the series. So here's your challenge. To take this, and it's, those are all printed in your bulletin, all those different prayers. To take that, word it whatever way you want to. Okay? But get the concept across that, God, I want to be able to love from my full life, not just from one area. Lord, I, I want to have more than a life of just worship and, and feel good. I want to have a life more than just living in my mind. I want to have a life more than just how I feel things. I want to have a life more than just what I'm doing and what I'm doing for you. Lord, make me a Mary and a Martha. Help me to be able to do all of these things. And, and God will integrate that. He'll, he'll bring that together. That's the goal, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, not some of it, all your soul, not some of it. All your mind, not some of it. All your strength. All at the same time. And he can do that. Okay? And as he does that, he often gives us an object to show that love to, which is loving your neighbor as yourself. So start that with the Lord. Start that. I'd say the first day to start that with being Jesus. <laughs> right? Father God, I ask that you would transform me so that I know your presence. And as a loved child, free me to be your instrument of love as I lift up Christ. Right? Take whatever one you want to start with and use it all. And I want to drop me an email. Give me a call. Let me know what's happening in you this week. Right? Not that I'm going to pull you up and say, oh, by the way, so-and-so said this. But it's just good to hear God at work. Right? in an area of your life that you're not quite used to God working in, wouldn't it be great to, to expand on that and begin to live out these words that we all know, but they actually become applicable? Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you love us beyond all things, that you gave your son to die for us, Father, and that you desire us to be in that love relationship with you. And Lord, as your loved children, Show us how we are to love. Open us up, Lord, from our minds and our hearts and our soul and our strength. Open us up. We reveal them to you. We, we ask you to come in and abide in all of those areas and help us to uh, love you, to choose you first in these areas. And Lord, we look forward to seeing what life will be like when we live it fully given over to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.